here in New Zealand, we are very fortunate that we don't, there's not a shortage of water, there's a shortage of how we actually store it. We start about storing that water for our use, which is, and as long as we do that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So, why? <laughs> well, we, we can reduce the demand of mains water, which has spin-offs not only in, in terms of cost, but also in the energy that it takes to transport and, and to maintain that system. So it's ultimately more sustainable. There are obvious environmental benefits as well. Um, in terms of environment, uh, collecting the rainwater, um, it's reducing the stress on the system that gets covered a little bit later in the slide. But in terms of stormwater, at the moment, what we're set, we've set up all our um, <coughs> municipal and infrastructural systems is to speed up the exit of water to get it off our wonderful pieces of concreted overland that's no longer permeable, where it can absorb into the ground water, and to, to speed its way, <coughs> very way off to sea to join the hydrological cycle again. However, as that earlier half hydrological cycle showed, you know, we're, we're, we're shortcutting the equation. There's the economic part as well, and that's becoming more and more. And I think especially as energy costs will rise, that will come, become more and more of an issue. Because there is a lot of energy involved in delivering water, not only in the pumping and the electricity that requires, but also in the infrastructure and the maintenance of infrastructure, all the piping um, that needs to be replaced, be it every 50 or 100 years or whatever it is. Also, by collecting rainwater, we can establish an emergency supply. And um, I, I sometimes go through the mental exercise of what would happen, um, how would I be affected if there was an earthquake? Lines might be ruptured. Who knows? A, a bad enough one, the dam could collapse. God forbid. But even just 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 your supply lines uh, get broken, and damaged, and it'll be quite some time. Uh, quite apart from power outages, preventing the pumping. Um, a volcanic eruption you know, could cause significant havoc, and it could actually that would also. Uh, create significant havoc in terms of, uh, uh, of, of problem of ash outfall and things, and you need to be able to try and minimize the effects of that. We can also reduce the effect of flooding by stormwater detention. So by slowing down the runoff and reducing the amount of runoff by actually storing the water, you know, we, we're actually reducing the impact of, of flooding, of erosion, and slowing down the process of the water returning to the sea. So that's by doing temporary storage. Okay, <clears throat> so there are three types of urban rainwater systems that we're going to look at today. I'll say at the outset, we're not focusing yet uh, with this workshop on drinking supply. That there is definitely the potential to expand to that, but that's not our focus. So the first one is what you would call a single purpose non-drinking water supply. The input rainwater from the roof and <coughs> basically you can use it for the garden, your washing, your toilet and any overflow goes back into the stormwater system. Then you have your single purpose stormwater detention. This essentially is water that you're not going to use but you're trying to prevent flooding and you're trying to prevent erosion and the effects of a large volume you know, in an extreme weather event, the water off your roof gets stored and then triple released. And that just slows down the process of the water flow. And then, probably more common, the dual purpose. So it's not drinking water supply and stormwater detention. You can see 
uh, down here, this only a small part of the tank is actually for supply. The larger part of the tank is used for stormwater detention. I want to state that um, uh, one of the reasons we're not considering drinking water is that the councils by and large have stayed clear of actually recommending using drinking water from off the roof because of the risks. Now you could argue you know, what the true risks are because a lot of people have been drinking water off the roof for years and it's been fine. But there have been cases where it hasn't worked out. So councils are allowing water and the Auckland Health Board allow it to be used for non-drinking water which is those purposes of laundry, toilet and garden use. But they do veer away <coughs> from people wanting to use it for drinking water. That might change in the future where we get more you know, con 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 confidence, but on the whole that's the way councils are currently looking at it. It's all about risk management and removing risk from yourself and passing it off to someone else. Can I ask, do you know whether there's any um, government local government bodies that are actually measuring the water table and how much it's dropping in different places, assuming it's dropping with the influx of, of more housing. Let's pass that ball straight over today. <laughs> <laughs> On a local council level, at a regional council level, they are essentially responsible for managing the actual, the actual water. At a national level, there is a move and there's a lot of discussion about having having national environmental water standards per, per se, but that hasn't really got that far. The, at a national level, the Ministry for the Environment are coming up with um, water indu, indu indicators, which they're going to be de developing along with other environmental indicators in the next few years and some of those water indicators will be measuring how much water is coming out of the ground compared to how much we actually have. So it's done on a pretty ad, 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 ad hoc basis at the moment but people realise that they need to have more knowledge and so they're trying to work that sort of way. Because if we did what we've got now we'd definitely have less later. Right. <laughs> And including the effects of climate change, the reason they have to bring those into effect. Because one of the studies of the finding is that the storm events will become more and more too frequent. So the wetter areas will get wet and the dry areas will get drier. And what was a one in 20 year event is likely to be a one in 10 year event in rough numbers. So they're trying to take those sorts of things into account as well in terms of councils are now having to work with more than just a yearly or three yearly plan. They have to make 10 year and 20 year plans. So it's sort of going to happen. Is that it? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see why we've got him. <laughs> we'll keep him on. <laughs>